Come from Capistrano? Yeah. They just pull a tree. They come to Capistrano. Oh, yeah. yeah. But will they come back? I heard the air is so polluted they won't because they've drawn all the groundwater out and it's a dust bowl, yeah. like the Salton Sea. So what do we do with air quality? Why do I have a child? I know. Get out of the city. Get out of the state. Oh, we got to live apple time. Oh, apple time is apple time is 7 o'clock. Okay. I see somebody what? sprinting in, so you might. I don't have any solutions to anything. I just two think it's fun. No, it's it's, it's all fun. That's more creative thinking than. Hey. Yes. Oh, yeah. Wow. Cool house. I think it's all fun, man. Hey. Well, how come people don't enjoy these things? It's a wonderful time. Okay, I guess it's safe. Your camera's good and good, ready to roll. Okay, I think, there are pictures I think we can dancing with a uh, safely call roll call, please. Sure. Stop Director things. Coverdell. Yes. Vice President Glasper. Here. Director Reynolds. Yeah. Director Flint. Here. President Michaels. Uh, President. Took a picture of the driver ran for office. The Pledge of Allegiance here. All right. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amen. Amen. Okay. So, welcome to the May 12th edition of uh, Coastside County Water District. Um, any public comments? Seeing none, we can go to the consent calendar. And if I... Who's one closet? it? Director Reynolds. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, that's why we ride it in there. Yeah, I did this ages ago. It <laughs> <looked> <laughs> good. No, I did it the minute she emailed it to me. Yeah, I, I did just try to get it over. Mr. Efficiency. Yeah. And you found everything to be in order? Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I, found, I found no discrepancies. Good. Uh, directors have any comments or items they would like pulled for further discussion or movement to uh, move pass to it approve as a whole? the consent calendar. Yeah, I'll make a movement to pass it. Okay. Second. Well, you can second it. Okay, I'll second it. Okay. Joanne, please. Sure. Director Coverdale? Aye. Vice President Glassberg? Aye. Director Reynolds? Aye. Director Flint? Aye. President Michelson? Aye. Thank you. Um, meetings attended. Director Comments. Who went to Aqua? Who was who? Okay, you may have something to say about Aqua. Yeah, and I have one when you get a minute. Okay. Um, well, uh, thank you to my fellow board members for sending me to Aqua. Um, it was my first time, and it was a really interesting experience. Um, there's so much to share that I won't take board time to share, but I, I came away with one overwhelming uh, reaction, and that is that whatever I may have thought before, there are 15 other opportunities to look at it a different way. <laughs> and um, it was really enlightening to hear what's going on at the state level, what's here, and also in some cases what's going on in other water districts related to and the state level, the watershed project, I thought was really interesting. Um, and uh, the groundwater, which they don't seem to know what to do with. Um, yeah. Nobody seems, the state doesn't seem to understand how to measure whether anything's effective or not as it relates to groundwater, uh, stormwater uh, collection. But at any rate, there were a lot of really interesting workshops uh, that I enjoyed going to. Some were, I got up and left because I had no idea what they were talking about. But for the most part, I did understand what they were saying. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to go, and, and I sure recommend. Uh, oh, and hearing the governor was a treat. Oh, okay, he, he was there. He was the keynote on the, I guess, the first day. It was more fun when Schwarzenegger was the governor. Yes. I don't know, this guy. <laughs> real excitement. <laughs> this guy was quite the comedian. He, uh, he, he it, let's put it this way, it made the first the front page of the B and the back page of the first section of the B it was a big deal when he his point that he was making um, uh, he was talking about the tunnels project in oh, the yeah, Delta and he was sure. basically yeah. saying they've put a million million hours man hours person hours of staff time into studying the alternatives and he says even if you believe that public servants are only 75 percent efficient so we still put 750,000 <laughs> hours in and so if if you're until you're until you put that many hours studying it shut up <laughs> oh, <laughs> i don't want to no. hear from you that made the front page of the sacramento oh my game. goodness so yeah well it's probably nice to see that you know all the other water districts in the state too are facing the same thing we are so we're not the only district facing which is going to what's going to be a very challenging year yeah. so it's nice to know 
There's a lot of company in the state. And it's many in a lot worse shape with yeah. much bigger challenges. Yeah, I can, I can only imagine. So, anyway, thank you for the opportunity to oh, go. Thanks for going. Good. Thanks. And then, Glenn, did you have something to add? Or? Yeah, I went on Monday. They had the California Drought Summit in Sacramento. And this was the regulators meeting to discuss what they're doing and what it looks like. And um, some of the, the, in, the two, two, a couple of things that were really interesting. Porterville has 800 dry wells. The state has 2,220 dry wells at this point and counting. Um, they feel mandatory water level monitoring of all groundwater will happen very rapidly. Um, the other part that was refreshing was that they were talking aggressively about planning for 2016, 2017 as a drought year. Um, they brought a meteorologist to talk about the forecast and they said that if we get an El Nino, there's a 60% chance of an El Nino and we'll get a 50% chance of rain if the El Nino comes. And so that was really interesting. They said the El Nino can flip either way. It can cause us a dry climate or a wet climate. And we need to be very careful that that we don't get excited that an El Nino would mean, and this was his way of saying the sea surface temperature is warm, which is one of the indicators of an El Nino. But then he wanted to caution us that that gives us a 50% chance of rain. Um, and then they had a whole group of people talking about how fast they're going to fast track. No permit will be allowed to sit, linger more than 90 days um, without the governor's office getting involved to move it, move it out. And, um, <laughs> yeah, I'll wait and see on that one. Would they, they had, <laughs> yeah, they <exactly>. had, <laughs> yeah. So that's what they were saying, um, and then they talked a bit about how hard they're working to get the money out, how fast, and then the rest of the meeting was on um, taking wastewater and using it for direct potable use, and um, the communities that are doing it. And actually, one of the reasons, inspirations for me attending this was our general manager uh, had encouraged me to look and think that way, and at this conference they had uh, several communities that were doing just that and quite successfully and what was really fascinating was that they had a speaker from San Diego who was the general manager of San Diego Water who tried this some 15 years ago and was soundly rebuffed and what he was taught what so the cool part was to hear these general managers and communities talking about how when faced against having no water and the loss of industry and the loss of development and the loss of really all, all of the community vitality that people quite cheerfully embraced the project and went at it. And then they had some slides showing the cost of desalinating water versus taking wastewater and running it through the additional steps to make it exceed drinking water quality and show that it's about a third the cost of desalinating water and that that made, you know, when you sort of walked people through and said, okay, you can spend two thirds more and, and desalinate it or you can take the wastewater and use it. So that was, that was my Monday. Good, thank you. Um, anyone else? I can tell you that Tuolumne Meadows received 24 inches of snow on this past Saturday. I can also tell you that There's six, coming. six yeah, of the six next eight coming. days, they're predicting yeah. snow and rain in the Sierra. Yeah. So it uh, could really be a switch. Weather patterns have been switching back for a long time. You know, a month pushed back into April, we didn't used to get a lot, and then started to get more. And so nothing would be better than a May miracle, be a whole new game. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's just as likely as the opposite. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, it's... I think it's a good time to pray for rain. Not too late to put the skis, keep the skis out. Well, there, there are no lift operators, but you can hike it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it looks wide at the top, man. <laughs> you can go to Mammoth. Huh? Oh, are they still running? Yeah. Oh, great. They got better sushi at Mammoth anyway. <laughs> okay, th thank you. Um, moving on to general business, Dave. Okay, our first item is the 
third amendment and this will probably not be the last amendment to the Alanto Properties Water Service Agreement. This is something we've been working on since 2009 and are there really no issues with uh, the Pacific Ridge subdivision. It's just that for a number of reasons construction has been delayed and our water service agreements always include a date by which the developer needs to s begin construction and then it, they also s it also establishes a deadline for completion of construction once it's started. So we've continually had to update our start date for the Alanto Properties development and they're supposedly really getting ready to start now. We've heard this before uh, but uh, the last in the last amendment we gave them until April 30th 2016 and they're not looking, look, they're not looking for much of a change to that but uh, what we didn't do in the uh, first amendment or in the second amendment was properly account in the language of the agreement for this phasing plan that they'd given us uh, that we approved in the first amendment. So we approved the phasing plan. We didn't adjust the language to, to handle the fact that there could be multiple start dates. And so that's what this third amendment does. Uh, they're supposed to start phase one now by July 1st, 2016. And then uh, phases two and three may happen separately. They may happen together. Uh, but the, this agreement establishes a, a deadline of July 1st, 2020, for start of for start of those phases, and the completion would have to come within a year after that. And the other thing, the other one of the other motivations for doing this amendment was, uh, Ilanto called us some months back and said that they would not be able to provide the bond our agreement requires, and they asked if they could provide an alternate form of security. So uh, this. Uh, allows them to give us an irrevocable letter of credit uh, in lieu of the required bonds. So uh, with that, you can answer any questions, but uh, we recommend approving this. Are they asking for extension from the city also, or is it just us? Or They have some... Uh, we, ha we decided quite a while ago that we weren't going to try to figure <laughs> out all of the other deadlines and schedules <laughs> from the other uh, agencies involved in this. You know, they've got a, they have Probably a, a good idea. they have a Sorry settlement, <laughs> they have a settlement with the city and with the Coastal Commission and, yeah, yeah, and, and they do have deadlines and, and when they say this uh, sort of conforms to the city schedule, we, we just nod our heads and say, okay, whatever. Um, so I, I don't know the answer to that, but I did I, I think the Ilanto representative, City of Quan, did say that their their agreement with the city is something like 2020. Yeah. So the, I mean, this horse has left the barn a long time ago. So right. There are no issues. Yeah. I mean, I, I from a staff standpoint, there are no issues. The fact they pulled a grading permit is, you know, an indicator that it's moving. And it's good to see that Carnoustie is actually starting to hook their units up too. So I think there's been a change in the economy, at least for now. We'll see how, how long that lasts. And unlike other developers, Ilanto has plenty of water connections. Yeah. Do we uh, prefer a irre irrevocable letter of credit, or would we rather just have a lien on the property? The property has tremendous value, right? Um, we prefer a irrevocable letter of credit. Perfect. Sounds like a good agreement, then. I move we approve it. I'll second that. Discussion? Vote. Yes, Dr. Coverdale. Aye. Vice President Glassberg. Aye. Dr. Reynolds. Aye. Dr. Flint. Aye. President Michelson. Aye. Uh, thank you. <coughs> I'm missing my beat. Yeah, I, I one, one quick question oh, wait, no, of the detail. public. Jules, you missed public comment by a few minutes, oh. uh, which is fine. I mean, I'll, I'll let you speak now unless you want to sit here for a while and, and speak later. It's up to you. No, I just have a, a thing I wanted to tell you. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll give you a couple, couple minutes right now if you want, then you can go home or whatever. Thank whatever you, you so choose. Thank you. Sure. Uh, members of the board, I, uh, I've lived here s since 1970, and um, about the beginning of this year, um, my wife started saying that she was tasting chlorine in the water, and I brought it to the attention of the folks here in the office, and they checked it out, and they said everything was okay. I've heard since then that 
evidently Denison water has been uh, coming in with, uh, with the Hetch Hetchy water and that it started about then and that it needs more treatment, obviously. And, and uh, I just thought that when something like that happens, you could tell the public so that we could be aware of it. Because if I'd have been aware of it, I, I, uh, you know, I wouldn't have had all this problem with my wife figuring out what was going on. And basically, it's an issue of in the morning, usually, when we're making coffee or tea. And I can always go and get a filter or something or buy some, some water at the store. But uh, it, it helps if you know about things like that. And maybe you folks put that out for the public and, and that, that you, were, you were taking the Denison water and mixing it in with our Hetch Hetchy water. But I, I didn't know it. And so I just wanted to let you know that all that this is something where the public could really be informed on something like that. And thank you very much for listening to me, and have a nice evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hey, and you're right, there is a taste difference between north end of our system and the south end. I mean, yeah. yeah. There, there, is a, there is a slight difference. Oh, definitely. I mean, my, my wife noticed it right away. Yeah. It took me a while to, to figure it out. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. One, uh, one uh, question that I'd like to ask Dave or somebody at of the Crystal Springs water that we utilize, what percentage of that would you guess is really from Hetchy? Zero now. But I mean, from in Crystal yeah, Springs, when we're, zero. When we're using oh, when we're on Crystal Springs. Yeah, when we're using Crystal Springs, what percentage of of Crystal Springs water is actually from the Hetchy system? Most of it. I, I would say the majority of it, uh, based just on the, on the fluoride residual, is, is they add fluoride up there. Mm -hmm. And uh, Crystal Springs it has a fluoride concentration about 0.7, which is about what we're supposed to be they're, they're adding. Right. Uh, so I would say when we're on Crystal Springs, the vast majority of that water did originate at Hedge Hedge. Yeah, because I, I think it's important to know that, you know, the Crystal Springs also captures runoff water. And I mean, the water that we take from Crystal Springs is blended, it's not like a direct pipeline shot from Hetchy. It more or less is. Is it? Mm -hmm. the but, only, but we the only water we that's not the only water that's not Hetch Hetchy would be the whatever drainage there is from local yeah. from right. the local watershed. So the majority of it is is nearly all Hetch Hetchy. But but whether we're pulling from Crystal Springs or Deniston, we treat them both. I mean, sure. Right. They both go through a, a rigorous treatment process. Sure. But they do it yeah they do it there is a there is a slight taste difference. I don't know if you know, a paragraph or two in the, in the, in the newsletter, or I don't know if you want to address it, or how we would address it, or... Well, thank you for listening. Yeah, thank, yeah. thank you. No, yeah, we, we definitely heard you. Us. Thank you. Um, okay. Thank you. Um, cool. 6B, please. Okay. Uh, the next item is a professional services agreement with Kennedy Jenks for a design of the Deniston Treated Water Booster Station and Transmission Pipeline. This project can go ahead now because we finished the Deniston San Vicente Water Project Water Supply Project Final Environmental Impact Report. The board certified it in February and, and it passed its challenge period in March. Uh, that, that allows us to move together, uh, move uh, forward on uh, some of the projects that were in the environmental impact report. Uh, of all the projects uh, that are part of that overall project, uh, this booster station and pipeline upgrade will provide the most immediate benefits and has probably the fewest uh, permitting hurdles. We don't need to get a permit from the Department of Fish and Wildlife to do this project. So uh, we're going to pick the low-hanging fruit first. Uh, Kennedy Jenks, uh, I, I've given you a little bit of history in the staff report. Uh, Kennedy Jenks in 2010 uh, did for us a preliminary design of the booster station. We realized we needed some more hydraulic information. That led us to award a contract to Kennedy Jenks for an update of the district's hydraulic model, and we're still uh, working on getting the right information out of that. And it's, it is, that's produced some really useful insights. Uh, and now we're at the point where we're ready to proceed with design. 
of the booster station and the pipeline uh, based on the schedule that Kennedy Jenks has uh, submitted in their proposal it looks like we could uh, if everything went well construct this project next year our, our uh, CIP contemplates that we've got 310,000 in this year's funding for design and I think 1.6 million in next year's for construction uh, so this is a project that it is really worthwhile to pursue. Uh, just to give you an idea of the kind of benefits we'll realize when this project is completed. Right now, at, at fiscal 2016 prices, a million gallons of water that comes from Crystal Springs costs the district $5,100 about. Just, and that's just the cost of the raw water. Uh, with this project in place, we'll be able to go to uh, a million gallons a day from Deniston instead of half a million. So every day that every day that uh, this project allows Deniston to run at twice its current capacity, uh, we're going to benefit by about two thousand five hundred dollars. So this uh, this project is a real money maker for the district or the having this in place will be a real money maker for the district so that's why we want to pursue it as it's a little bit different from kind of the, the risk avoidance motivation that that's driving us on the El Granada pipeline final phase this is a real opportunity to save money once this goes into place uh, so Kennedy Jenks has submitted a uh, design proposal uh, I do need to correct the staff report. Uh, we we did a, some last minute revisions to the to the scope, and it's now the total scope is uh, three hundred thousand dollars. Well, forty dollars shy of three hundred thousand dollars. I don't know how they get it that precise, but anyway, I called it three hundred thousand. So the recommendation is that that uh, we approve uh, an award to Kennedy Jenks of this design work for uh, a time and materials cost not to exceed. $300,000. And if you have any questions about uh, the technical part of the proposal, Joel Faller, the, the partner from Kennedy Jenks who's worked with us, is here tonight. Um, and if you have any questions about the staff side of it, I can answer those. So um, how much is the money going to cost us? Because this was specifically what was tagged out in the Prop 1 funding at 1%, 1.5%. We haven't talked about Prop 1 funding, but... Right, it hasn't been re it's being released this month, so... Right. Uh, we can look into that. The assumption, uh, the assumption uh, on this project is that it will be debt funded. Yeah. Uh, we haven't, we're agnostic when it comes to, uh, you know, what the best way to do that is we met Mary and I met with iBank last week that would be a pretty straightforward approach and what do we would, pay for that our current iBank loan for the Denison projects at about three percent uh, iBank is fast no string you know fewer uh, bureaucratic hurdles uh, it's a not not a competitive process really they've got the money to lend so that would uh, that would allow us to get this project. If it allows us to get the project in place more quickly, that would be great. It, it would be. Uh, uh, it, we'll also take a look at that, the availability of that other funding. One of the things we could to look at doing is doing paying for this with the iBank money, and then doing for submitting the shovel ready plans for the one and a half percent that the uh, Prop One money is is specifically geared, earmarked for local supply, drought mitigation, shovel ready, and 30-day turnaround on funding. Mm -hmm. wow. Well, this might be a good oh, a good impressive. project. To, this this will be shovel ready pretty quickly. Oh, well, that's why and it, it sort of jumped to it, and it, and it nine is, months. we're diversifying <coughs> with local supply, right. which is what the state has said they want to specifically look for and uh, and fast track because right. they, they that's what they want right um, but they won't retroactively pay so that's why I asked 
Um, one of the things I notice is they're talking about being ready to bid uh, right after the first of the year. I mean, the document's ready to go around, you know, right after the first of the year of 2016. And that's usually a good time to bid um, because contractors often are trying to line up work for before the summer hits and they get written, they know they're going to get busy. So I would just want to encourage us to stay on top of them and their design so that that actually becomes a real date rather than an anticipated date. I think that if uh, things are already getting more expensive and if that's a better time to bid, then let's do it. Look at Joel when you say that. <laughs> He'll be watching you. Yeah. <laughs> One of many. Ken, please. Um, are we ever interested in uh, trying to build incentives in the contract? Like, if we have a not to exceed contract with Kennedy Jenks, does it make sense to offer them 50 cents of every dollar that they save under the budget number in the contract form? In other words, if they bring it in for 250000 uh, we save twenty-five thousand, and and they get an additional twenty-five thousand dollars for performing well. Are we interested in any kind of incentives like that? That been done. Um, I'd say, for the most part, on professional services, it is on a time and expense time. reimburse basis. On some projects that you may bid on a lump sum basis, there might be that incentive clause. It's, you, you find that more in like a design build type contract where there's some incentives for either early performance or performance under budget. And I don't see it, I haven't seen it very often in a professional service context like this one. Mm -hmm. Well, I was just thinking that our incentive is to, you know, like Arnie says, to get it done. And of course, we're always looking to save money and get it done under budget. It's time and materials, so they get paid no matter what, up to that amount of money. But, you know, if they're use some extra energy and extra effort, we reward them with a bonus, and uh, we save money. I don't know. It just seems like it's a partnership as opposed to a services-only contract. I'm just throwing it out there. How firm is the delivery date on this? Can you do it? Yes. In writing? Yeah, yeah. Does, that, does that come through on the camera from the audience? <laughs> How's the audio from the audience? <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, I have to also say that that uh, the d district staff effort uh, is th on the critical path in certain in certain parts of this. So we <laughs> share. <laughs> we we can't put it all on Kennedy Jakes. We sh we do share part of the responsibility because there are important decisions yeah. that we have to make, and we don't always just uh, shoot from the hip. We have to think about some of those things sometimes. So um, I, I these are these are complex projects, and sometimes for reasons that uh, we don't anticipate they take a little bit longer but but we're committed to to doing the right thing and if it's worth it to take a little more time then we do that well, i don't yeah. want you to shoot from the hip but i'd like you to be locked and loaded right. yeah. well being it's mid-may I, I think uh, it's it sounds like a pretty reasonable it is a time. reasonable schedule yeah yeah we're, we're not asking for yeah okay conditions that come up okay okay thank you um any other thoughts from the board yeah, I, I, Arnie, I think you're, you're right. This is, you know, this is something we'd like to do spring. So that's that's a great point. Okay, what do we have? Uh, I move that we authorize the general manager to enter into a contract with Kennedy Jenks for the design of the Deniston treated water booster station and transmission pipeline. Time materials cost not to exceed three hundred thousand. I'll second that. Thank you. John, please. Yes, Dr. Covenell. Aye. Vice President Glassberg. Aye. Director Reynolds. Aye. Director Flint. Aye. President Michelson. Aye. Thank you. Okay. Am I getting into the, the meat of the uh, agenda here, Dave? We're not quite to the meat yet. <laughs> <laughs> just... Well, this is where the money goes. So this is, a, uh, I'll let Mary uh, talk about her staff report uh, on the budget, but this is basically just the the, we always uh, present the budget at each public meeting leading up to the uh, leading up to the budget and rate increase public hearing, which we're now going to have on June thirtieth. So, in terms of the budget, it um, we haven't made any significant well changes except for one. Um, San Francisco actually came out with their water rates, um, and we had some good news, and we actually have a 
a little bit lower rate. Um, they came in at 28%. It, um, it actually still means 30% for us because of our treated water dis, uh, discount. But we were able to reduce um, expenses by about 101,000. Um, so, um, but everything else in the budget is the same. We have, uh, um, and the CIP, we still have um, the same as from our CIP budget has not changed. Uh, workshop. So, with that, um, in we're, um, our the, the operating budget was used to <coughs> do a cost of service analysis, which um, um, John is uh, is going to be presenting in a few minutes. I, I didn't understand the comment about the. I thought the two percent was a savings. It is a savings to us. So, so we're, we're at 28, I guess. The, the rate increase was 30? Well, yeah, yeah. See, and, and it's it's, it was 31 percent, but we have a, um, we, we have the, the rate increase plus we get a, a percent discount for our treated water. Right. So the combination of those, we, uh, it's a, the, um, we have a 30 percent rate in, increase for the district, um, not 28 percent per se, but it is, um, we, we benefited from the reduction. Okay, so our increase is 30%, but because of our reduction, <coughs> it's effectively 28%. Is that, is that correct? No, it... I'm confused. Yeah, because okay, you, you're, no, you're, you're, you're adding 2% no, 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 and I'm subtracting no, our, so our, our increase is, our increase is, uh, for us, is 30%. Okay. Um, what was it? And that's, it, we had it up um, in the 32, 33% uh, okay. increase. There we go. Right. <laughs> yes. I don't know the, the, nominal incre the nominal increase from San Francisco, the San Francisco wholesale rate <laughs> was announced, uh, they announced that they yeah. were going to increase it 31% and they changed that to 28. But our picture's a little different because of our untreated water discount. So yeah, before, man, man. our previous budget was about 32, 33, now it's 30. That's yeah. the MMM factor. Yeah. Uh, we'll live on. Thank you. Um, okay. So no action required on the budget. And, and uh, we do need to. We got the next two items out of order. We'll we'll take item uh, e first. E first. <coughs> yes. And then we can get to item D. Okay, so we're on E, mm -hmm. cost of service analysis and proposed water rate changes. We met with the finance committee. We met with the finance committee today, and just by way of introduction to this item, uh, we'd like to point out that thing, a lot has changed over the last uh, five or six weeks since we had our board budget workshop on March 31st. And we kind of thought we had it figured out. On, on March 31st, we came in proposing a solution that involved a rate increase of 19 percent. Got some input from the board that said, well, after we, after you thought about all the risks we presented, it seemed, and, and the level of the district's reserves, it seemed that, that uh, you might want to go higher. We came back, well, that was March 31st. The next day, uh, the governor came out with his 25 percent mandatory reduction statewide. We didn't know at that point what the what the regulations would say. We didn't know we were going to end up in an eight percent tier, but that all of a sudden made the risks look a lot more likely. And so we came back at the April 14th meeting uh, with a, a, a basically a proposal for an across the board an across the board 27 percent rate increase. That was kind of the upper end of our solution range at that point. Um, but then on April 20th, uh, we got the San Juan Capistrano decision, uh, and uh, uh, Patrick will talk about that a little bit in a minute. But basically, we went back to the drawing board after the San Juan Capistrano decision came out. We and, and a lot of other water agencies around the state have really been scrambling to figure out how we can uh, come up with uh, rate analyses that would withstand the kind of test that, that 
uh, San Juan Capistrano's tiered rates failed in the San Juan Capistrano decision. And so what we are going to present tonight is our, uh, in terms of a cost of service analysis, is our is significantly different from what the district has done for the last few years, significantly different from what we, in terms of, of an approach, from what we talked about on April 14th. Uh, not that the result is terribly different, but uh, uh, it is different. We went over that with the finance uh, committee today, and I thought we would just, so, so that's kind of the background of, of what the last month has been like for us. Uh, and I thought I would let Patrick talk a little bit about this San Juan Capistrano decision because that's really what kind of changed our direction and what, what we're thinking about as we look at this cost of service analysis. Great. Uh, sure. Thank you. Um, and I'm not just going to jump right into the case. I'm going to provide a little background and backdrop for it. First, as Dave mentioned, um, a lot has happened actually since the end of March until now, and at the end of March, some State Water Resource Control Board emergency regulations actually came into effect on March 27th. Um, all that has changed since the governor's executive order and uh, the various versions of State Water Resource Control Board emergency regulations that came down after that and were ultimately adopted on May 5th, and we'll get into that. That's your agenda item F, so we'll spend a little bit more time talking about that there, but that also change the framework because, as Dave mentioned, on April 1st, what came down was statewide conservation goals of 25 um, percent, and that would have impacted us significantly had that stayed the way it was and applied directly to us, but it turns out it, it didn't. So for purposes of San Juan Capistrano, what I want to do is give a little refresher on Proposition 218 and what it means to kind of set the stage for what happened in San Juan Capistrano. So the, the backdrop is up until 2006, um, water rates, the base charge and consumption charges were not subject to Proposition 218, even though Proposition 218 came down in the late 1990s. So in 2006, it was the California Supreme Court in the Bighorn decision that said water rates are subject to 218. So that changed the framework for all water agencies. And um, as a reminder, Proposition 218 has both procedural requirements and substantive requirements. The procedural requirements, we're going to start probably tonight with our next agenda item, which is sending out the notice that identifies what the rate increase is and providing 45-day notice for a public hearing. Um, what I'm going to focus on is the substantive requirements, because that was really at the heart of the San Juan Capistrano case, and, and basically most Proposition 218 cases that have come down in the last, you know, five, ten years. Um, in the beginning, there were some procedural cases, but most of them have been substantive cases. Um, and just to remind you, there are four main substantive requirements, two of which really focus in on the San Juan Capistrano case, and that is um, our rates must not exceed the cost of service. We can't spend money on things that um, weren't for the purposes for which the rates were charged. And, um, and the cost of service may not exceed the proportional requirements for, for serving the, the property. So those are the main cost of service and proportionality are really the main substantive requirements of Proposition 218. Um, so San Juan Capistrano, um, it really held, so, so that was a taxpayer lawsuit against the city of San Juan Capistrano, and the city of San Juan Capistrano was the water supplier. Mm -hmm. So not only were they a city, they were, also, they were also the ones that provided the water service, they were the ones that set the, their rates. Um, and so there were, two, there were actually two significant holdings in that case. The tiered rate holding is the one that's getting all the press and what we're hearing about, but there was another significant holding that I think is relevant here for the district, and that is um, one of the holdings in the San Juan Capistrano case said that, hey, we can take the cost, and in their case it was a recycled water project, and said you can take the cost that you spend for this recycled water project that would only serve certain customers, it wouldn't serve the entire district, and factor that into the entire rate base, is it in a nutshell. So you can take these various different capital costs, bring it all together, and your rates can be structured on that. So you can, you can um, it, it, uh, have those costs of the recycled water uh, project spread across your entire rate base. And that was a, that's a really good holding, because if you apply it here, we have the Denniston San Vicente project, 
um, which only serves some of the customers. We also have a, uh, we're talking a lot about a recycled water project of our own that might come on it. So, so the, good, the good news here is that those, those uh, costs can be factored into our rate base. So that's, that was a really good part of the San Juan Capistrano decision. Um, the tiered rates. So the San Juan Capistrano decision basically held that the city's tiered rate structure violated Proposition 218. So what the court didn't say is that tiered rate structures are in violation of 218. So two, two very different things. So the, the headlines are different. When it first came down, it was like, oh, tiered rates are dead. That is not what the decision said. The, the decision said the city's tiered rate structure did not comply with the substantive requirements of 218 because the city did not justify their rates based on a cost of service analysis and proportionality requirement. And they had a tiered residential rate uh, structure. And ultimately, the, um, the city's, the judge said, uh, the court said, um, that they didn't even try to do a cost of service analysis. And that's what kind of came out in the decision. They just, they, the, the city's position was, we don't have to do a cost of service analysis. We have the, the legislative discretion to, um, to set the tiers where we want, to charge based on these tiers, and we don't even have to do a cost of service analysis. And the court said, no, it's not right. The city came up with, a, with had a few other arguments. They said, you know, because of uh, Article 10, Section 2, which is another provision of the California Constitution that says uh, you can't waste water and um, you can't use it unreasonably. They said, well, because of that constitutional provision, we must have tiered rates and it trumps 218. The court said no. Um, and a third argument that the city raised is, well, our higher tiers are really not um, related to, they're not property related fees subject to 218, they're penalties. And the court said no. So the court struck down the three main reasons that the city came up with and said, you got to do a cost of service analysis. Um, my own reading, and, and by the way, many attorneys, we were at Aqua last week, many attorneys in the, in the water industry are debating kind of what this decision means, interpreting it different ways. The rate consultants are all trying to figure it out too, and there's different views on all this. This is just my own personal view, is I think that the, the court was <coughs> underwhelmed with the argument that said, we don't, we don't have to do this at all. Um, and they said, no, 218 says it must be based on cost of service and must be proportional. <clears throat> so San Juan Capistrano, again, this is my view, took the case law that was in place one step further. So 218 has always said you must be proportional and you must be based on the cost of service. What was kind of done in the past and in common is you take that overall you know, the, all, the, all the different capital improvement projects, all your cost of service, and I'm focusing now on a single utility district like us, that's all we do is provide water, factor it into your revenue requirements, and you justify your costs based on that global amount. So $10 million budget, $10 million revenue requirement, your rates are going to cover $10 million, all okay. San Juan Capistrano said, if you have tiered rates, you need to take that one step further and you need to justify the cost of service based on the cost of service of those different tiers. So for those who use less water, if you're gonna have a, a lower cost, you need to justify it. If you're gonna have higher cost for those who use more water, you need to justify that. That's all new. And so I give a lot of credit to Mary and Dave and John and Seema. They, they, <laughs> they heard this uh, mid, mid to late April, and we really did a lot of work to um, to base the new rates that are being proposed tonight based on this new case that came down um, that really relates to cost of service. Um, I, want, I want to just remind uh, the district and, and the board in particular that the San Juan Capistrano is one case in a very complex world uh, of constitutional provisions, statutes, other cases, and uh, regulations and, and governor's executive orders <laughs> that have all come down. And so um, what, what lawyers are supposed to do is try to harmonize all of the, you know, again, two California constitutional provisions that come into play, 218 um, and Article 10, Section 2, unreasonable use of water. Um, we've got water code sections 
that basically say budget-based, allocation-based rates are okay, um, provided you do it a certain way, and there's other statutes that say that tiered rates are, are, are okay, you just need to do it a certain way. Um, we have a number of other court decisions that have also held tiered rates are okay and provided some different, um, different opinions on how you go about doing it. Um, so for example, you don't have to, your, your analysis doesn't have to be perfect. You don't have to go parcel by parcel to determine cost of service. You can kind of look at it based on classes and, and, and broader tiers. Um, and we also have a, a, a governor's executive order that came down that says, that directs the State Water Resource Control Board to work with local agencies to, um, to achieve these statewide conservation goals in a way that um, where, where pricing is a factor. We haven't gotten that guidance yet, but that's coming down, and so um, the State Water Resource Control Board has said, uh, when that guidance comes down, we, we will do it, but we also are aware of San Juan Capistrano, and San Juan Capistrano doesn't say that tiered rates are not okay. They, in fact, they, there's language in the court decision that says it is okay. Um, and so what we need to try to do is, is to harmonize all of this until we get clear, clear guidance, which, which may come down soon. So um, what I heard at ACWA was that, um, I'm on the Legal Affairs Committee, was that um, the city had, um, had filed a petition for rehearing. Thanks to John today, he was on a conference call, he said they, they pulled that back. Uh, so correct me if I do anything wrong, but they're going to appeal to the California Supreme Court is what it, what it looks like is going to happen. So who, who knows whether the Supreme Court will take it up. So I don't think that this is the end of the story for this because it's, this decision couldn't have come at a worse time. Um, but again, it's, it's not earth shattering in the sense that it says your analysis must be based on the cost of service. So that's the framework. I'm happy to answer any questions anybody might have about that. So this case was at the appellate course Correct. court level? Correct. So that's usually more than one judge. That yeah, it's usually a panel three. three. Yeah. And, and if I remember correctly, the they did explicit that it was it is understood that if there's water rationing or water allotment penalties were not included in this, that's a separate issue. So somebody uses too much water. So for instance, San Jose has announced a monthly allotment, and they can impose a penalty fee for using more than that allotment. So it, um, this is where you'll you might get different attorneys in the industry taking different positions or interpreting things a different way. Um, my view is it depends on how the penalty is structured. So if um, what what's the city tried to argue in San Juan Capistrano is they had these rates that are based on usage, and because they were higher, they were penalties, not subject to 218. My own view is when, um, is when you, you, t you, it is correct, that you can have penalties that are not subject to 218 because they're not property related fees, then you also, then you immediately need to look at Proposition 26 because it's, if it says it's not, you know, anything could be a tax or assessment, but there's a bunch of exceptions to that. And you need to look at those exceptions and penalties, just like 218 fees that are subject to 218 are exempt from 26. I think though, that if you tie your penalty to a consumption, uh, a consumption you run the risk of a court looking at that and saying, well, if it's really, if your penalty is tied to X, using X amount of units and it's 50 cents more per unit, I think you really run the risk that it's gonna be determined to be a property related fee subject to 18. As compared to saying uh, the penalty is $50 per day regardless of how much, you know, if you go over your allotment. Um, yeah. So, but that's just that's just my own interpretation and but that's to be decided probably by a judge at some point. We don't want to be the test case. Oh, I know. That's why I'm asking the question. But if San Francisco to were, were to apply a penalty to us, that if we go over by 1,000 gallons, we pay a $10 fee, and if we go over by 10,000 gallons, we pay a $100 fee, could we then pass that proportionally on to the customer and say, if you go over then you, and we could then trace that back and say it's directly related to the amount of water that the customer wasted, and so thus it's proportional to the actual, it's justifiable to the actual cost, not arbitrary. 
Right. So, so I think there's two different things going on there. N number one, you can pass on costs that we incur to the customer. Um, depending on how you pass that on and how it's imposed upon us, we may have to comply with Proposition 218 unless we're going to do it on the front end and go through a 218 process that says, hey, we're going to pass these costs through. You can do that. You can pass through wholesale costs as long as you do it in the context of a 218 analysis, just like you can pass on um, uh, inflationary increase as well. Yeah. But you, but you need to follow the process. Right. And San Francisco hasn't actually announced penalties, so we can't really front load it. Right. San Francisco, that, that's a contract issue. So, and I haven't really gone into it. John might be able to uh, provide some insight on it. But, but my understanding is when San Francisco goes to mandatory rationing, there's uh, a contractual requirement that says, here's how those costs are going to be passed through. Here are the penalties for environmental right purposes um, and it's just I, I probably will have to look at that at some point but I haven't really spent been a lot of other things to look at in this in the short term <laughs> okay. but great great question yeah all right yeah anyone else have questions or move on move on okay well fortunately when this the San Juan Capistrano decision came down we had already been working on our rates with our rate consultant uh, HF and H we have the John Farnkoff and Seema Mustafa here tonight. Uh, we quickly kind of changed directions and started working on cost of service analysis uh, somewhere shortly after April 20th. And uh, uh, that, that work, really pretty intense over the last uh, three weeks, uh, has uh, produced this uh, water rate structure update, which uh, HF and H is going to tell us about tonight. And with that, I'll introduce John Farnkoff. Board, good evening. I appeared here, uh, I think it was your first board meeting in the trailer <laughs> last year uh, to go over our proposal and answer some questions. And uh, a lot has happened uh, since then, as well as just uh, very recently. Um, the, um, the study that uh, we've written up here is in this uh, report, uh, May 8th, that you got. Um, the um, first page of the governor's executive order uh, was printed on the inside here because I think it's, it's pretty significant that we are in a state of emergency. We have been in a state of emergency since uh, his declaration January 17th, 2014. So just tracing back a little bit farther, there's some history here that um, right now has come together in tonight's presentation. And I think the best place to start, well, first, uh, just the presentation outline, what we want to do is just kind of methodically work through the revenue requirements that um, rates have to uh, provide for the cost of service analysis, the uh, residential rate design, which has been modified, uh, pr proposed uh, modifications, uh, bill comparisons, and then a summary. Um, so to to start uh, <clears throat> going through the analysis, uh, the best place I think to start is with these demand projections uh, that you see on, on page two. Uh, you see the uh, actual uh, uh, sales for fiscal 13-14, the estimate for the current year, and then the projection for next year. And you see the, the decreases that have occurred. And this is, this is the projected sales that have to generate the revenue to cover your, your revenue requirements and so you know getting in a situation here where you're selling less and your costs aren't going down mean that your rates have to to go up uh, to um, at least stay revenue neutral and in this case you know costs are are also going up so it's it's a uh, not a nice position to be in and if we look at those costs in the next slide the revenue requirement projections at the top <coughs> we first have the projection of the revenue under the current uh, rates with the uh, reduced demand uh, that's called for, <coughs> excuse me, um, almost $8 million. Uh, if you compare that with the revenue requirement uh, projections that have just recently been um, pulled together, um, there is a, a shortfall, significant shortfall, $1.9 million. Uh, part of that is related to increased costs, and part of it is specific to um, the demand management program. In total, uh, there's a 24% shortfall between your um, uh, revenue requirements and the revenue from rates. Uh, the, the, the 
you know, the cost increases, the SFPUC cost of water is significant uh, also, as well as some um, deferred capital. So we're trying to set these rates to deal with the reduced sales and your increased costs. If we look now uh, at the current rate structure, it has two components, the base service charge that covers a portion of the fixed costs, <coughs> and it's based on the size of connection. Uh, that, that's very standard in the industry. What you have here is um, very representative of the, uh, the industry standard. The quantity charge for the residential customers uh, is tiered. There are four uh, tiers there. Um, you see uh, the break points. These are 100 cubic feet on a bi-monthly basis, um, one through eight hundred cubic feet. Uh, it's about a, a hundred gallons a day. Gets you up to about a hundred gallons a day uh, in that first tier, and then. Uh, so forth, and you see how the quantity charge goes from 655 to almost two times at 1161. The non-residential customers' uh, quantity charge is a uniform uh, rate; it's not tiered. It's the same amount for uh, per 100 cubic feet for any level of demand, and that's also um, pretty standard in the industry. Um, the quantity charges are paying, uh, you know, portion of the fixed charges as well as other variable uh, costs, um, and it's it's. Unlike the base service charges, which are not specific to customer classes, uh, if you have a one-inch connection, it's the same regardless of what class you're in. Your uh, quantity charges do vary by customer class. So now getting into the cost of service analysis, uh, <clears throat> the we I guess we had the, the good fortune of um, some additional assistance uh, that Mary was able to provide in getting into the, the cost of service analysis and uh, working through the analysis uh, the allocation of costs into the fixed and volumetric cost categories, uh, the um, uh, the allocation of uh, primarily capital costs went into the the fixed component, and the remainder of the fixed costs, of which you know it's quite significant. You've got 70 plus percent of your total costs are fixed. Those are covered by uh, your quantity charges uh, plus the variable. Um, the the analysis um, split the um, uh, variable costs into a base volumetric component that covers the SFPUC's cost of water, pumping power, uh, administrative and operating costs, uh, and then the demand management component. Um, you'll see as, as we get into the rate design why we did that and, and how those costs are spread across uh, uh, the tiers in the residential class in particular. Um, the, the next slide, uh, page six, is, is a diagram that shows the results of the cost of service analysis. There are the, you know, roughly $2 million to be recovered by the base service charge out of the nearly $10 million re revenue requirement. And then you see the, how the, the base volumetric and the demand management costs were broken down between the residential and the non-residential customers. Another way of looking at that, and this, this, this gets into the, the actual rate uh, derivations for each of the customer classes is on the next slide. It shows the, the increase uh, from the current revenue from each of the charges, a uh, portion of which is uh, attributable to just cost increases. And then there's the cost of service adjustment that came out of Mary's analysis. And um, when uh, costs were apportioned either based on flow, differences in flow between the residential and the non residential customers, as well as um, what are referred to as equivalent meter units, which are a, a measure of capacity. Um, since the last time a cost of service analysis had done, things have changed here, and the relative proportions between the, the two classes indicated that it was appropriate to shift some of the responsibility from the non-residential quantity charges to the residential quantity charges and the base service charge. And you see how that worked out here, uh, both in dollars <coughs> as well as the percent change. Uh, just just a side comment, about 21% of the revenue uh, as a result of this is recovered from the base service charge. And that would rate your structure overall as a, you know, it has a good conservation orientation. Um, it wasn't designed just to do that. I mean, this is just what came out of the cost of service analysis. So if you, if you now work with the cost of service analysis, you'll see that in, in making the rate adjustments that the base service charges uh, increased 18 percent. Um, there was no change in the relationship of the base service charges across the range of sizes of services. So it was just an across-the-board increase to all of the, the base service charges. Um, 
pretty straightforward. The non-residential quantity charges increased 15%. Again, it's just a single uniform rate, went up 15%, uh, very straightforward. And that, that rate uh, combines the base uh, volumetric and demand management components. When we talk about the residential quantity charges, it's a lot more complicated because it's tiered. We change the sizes of the tiers as well as the rates for each of the tiers. Um, it combines the base and demand components in each of the four uh, quantity charges. Um, but to understand the impact and the percentage increase, um, uh, you know, it, it's going to depend on what level of demand a customer has. And we'll, we'll get, get into explaining that in a little bit more detail later. But I'd like to explain the um, concepts that were involved in the residential quantity charge uh, design. Um, sticking with four tiers uh, makes good sense. Uh, that's a, there, there are costs appropriate to each level of your four tiers as we go through costing them out. Um, we did look at the, the size of the, the, the tiers where the break points are that separate uh, the volumes of water. Um, what we tried to do is we correlated those break points more closely with where customer's current use is. Uh, I, I would guess that the last time that those break points were set, um, demand was different. Uh, and it was probably higher. There has been a, you know, just over the last decade or so, there has been improved efficiency and um, customer awareness of conservation. And people, uh, we've just seen a, a gradual downward decline in water use. And so um, we did uh, make, we're recommending some adjustments in how big the tiers are. Um, and then, uh, once you know the size of the tier, that kind of defines ranges of service that you're providing customers, and we costed those out. <coughs> so what we have in the design right now, you'll see uh, for each of the tiers, um, the current breakpoints and the proposed breakpoints, and the relationship between those breakpoints and how we would characterize the service that is provided in each of those those breakpoints. So just going through each of the proposed breakpoints, the so 0 to 4, uh, 100 cubic feet, that is uh, providing for essential, very essential indoor water use. It's only 50 gallons per day, not per capita, per 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 day, per customer, so, um, per account. So it's it's very minimal use. It's, it's like, you know, real tight apartment uh, house um, uh, water use. <coughs> uh, the next tier uh, brings customers up to a uh, combination of more indoor uh, water use as well as uh, what, when we look at your customer billing data, recent customer billing data, would amount to median summer water use. So there's, there's water in there for irrigation, uh, getting up to uh, 1,600 cubic feet. And that contrasts, you know, with where you currently are right now at 25. That would appear to be uh, overly generous, frankly, just given what your customers have been using recently, which also reflects conservation, uh, I should add. And finally, in uh, Tier 3, um, going up to 3,000 cubic feet, that's approximately two times uh, the summer median use. And the fourth tier, everything above 30, um, uh, you know, we're not going to candy coat it. We would view that right now as being excessive use. Um, that is, uh, you know, compared to current uh, median summer water use, it's also, um, you know, compared to what you currently have right now at 40 plus, um, it's, it's, it's a, we've, we've shaved that considerably. Yes, sir. That number of uh, 100 acre feet, is that for a two month period or a one month? Yes, these are bi monthly uh, 100 cubic foot amounts, yes. Yeah. Uh, so we, we're, we're not changing that billing period, although I think there has been some discussion about it will change. going to monthlies. Um, and um, so some of these breakpoints are not exactly, I think median summer water use is 1,500 cubic feet, but we chose 16 uh, so that if you go to monthly billing, that splits in two uh, evenly, you know, close enough. Um, we have two graphs tonight that are, um, that require a little heavy lifting. Um, this one is a, uh, it's, it's called a cumulative bill distribution. What we did was we took all of the residential bills from fiscal 13, 14, and we sorted them from lowest to highest, and then we plotted them cumulatively. So on the y-axis, it, it runs from 0% to 100%, and on the x-axis, it is the 100 cubic feet per bimonthly bill. And maybe the easiest way to get a grip on this is um, we have, you know, three curved lines on here. The green line 
uh, is the number of pills. And if you look on the y-axis at 50%, where the green um, uh, line intersects, you go down to the y-axis, that's around 1,200 cubic feet, uh, which happens to be uh, median use. 50% of the bills are less than that, and 50% of the bills are more than that. So what this does is it gives us a, a, a feel for where the distribution of bills uh, are uh, from the lowest to the highest consumption. And if you look at the uh, blue and the red lines, you'll see the cumulative consumption, uh, which is pretty close to also the cumulative revenue that you get from that consumption. The dashed vertical lines are the, the, the blue ones are the current breakpoints, and the red ones are the proposed breakpoints. And we've just got some arrows that show how the breakpoints are shifting to the left and the size of the tiers is shrinking, uh, you know, based on the, the uh, service conditions that I, I described in the uh, previous graph. So this is an important tool in understanding the, the impact that these breakpoints have on customers. So for example, if you look at your highest tier right now at 4,000 cubic feet and you plot up uh, from the x-axis at 40 to where that intersects uh, the green line, you'll see that there's just a few percent of the customers that fall into that, that top tier. It hardly affects um, uh, uh, very many customers. Most of the, the bills are less than that. But you'll, you'll see that there is a disproportionate amount of water and revenue that's associated with those very few bills uh, if you look at where the uh, red and the blue lines intersect that, that vertical dash line. So we're trying to, to target water use in that high area, which we know is you know, more than two times the summer median. Uh, and you know you you can go through that same exercise with any of these other uh, breakpoints again to get a feel for the uh, the distribution of the bills consumption and, and revenue. Um, another way to look at these numbers is summarized in the, the following slide where we've just ta tabulated the um, uh, what percent of the water is billed within each of these tiers. Uh, first, the top box represents uh, the current. Um, breakpoints uh, where we're showing the volumes of water uh, in each of the tiers and the, uh, the number of bills and we show them on a percentage basis and so you can see right now with the current breakpoints where you, when you get into tier three and above there are only about five percent there's only about five percent of the water seven percent of the bills there so what 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 we're doing in, if you look at the lower box here is by making those tiers smaller more customers find themselves paying more in the higher tiers. And that's the idea here. Um, uh, basically, there are costs that are associated with providing that level of service that we are trying to make sure are captured by this shift in the tier structure. So, you know, as we say here, that we're trying to improve the alignment of the services that they receive with the corresponding costs. And during a shortage, you know, high water use is, is placing a higher burden on the system, and there is a greater cost associated with it. So um, if we move now on to the next slide, with those, you know, um, before I finish, um, I, I, I probably should talk to you a little bit about today's webinar because there was considerable discussion about penalties and it, it, it might be of interest to you but um, let me save that okay but but you know please uh, if you have any I'll, questions I'll remember yeah 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 <laughs> yeah well you know this might be a good slide uh, actually to, to get into that a little bit but if, if we work through this you know we've got the breakpoints that you see there and the associated volumes of water and what if, if you recall we have broken the uh, uh, the revenue to be recovered from the quantity charge into the base volumetric component and the demand management component. And <coughs> the, um, the concept here is that the base volumetric component is uh, to be paid at any level of use across all of the, the tiers. But the demand management component is apportioned into the higher tiers. That for demand in that 50 gallon per day tier one, I don't think you have to spend very much time 
providing customer service and other service to those customers to be the super savers that they are. So we are exempting them from covering any of those demand management costs. And it starts to get picked up in the uh, second, third, and fourth tiers that you see in column C. Um, those are the unit costs associated with the demand management cost. So in tier two, where there's a considerable amount of water, that's where most of the water is, there is a component of demand management that's picked up, but it's pretty small, 98 cents. Uh, and it increases in uh, tiers three and four because of the additional effort that it requires to get the savings out of those customers that are in highest use. Something's going on there that needs to, to be uh, controlled. Uh, you want to help them reduce their water use. Um, it's, it's not at a sustainable level, um, at least, you know, in looking at this coming year, uh, unless it's a wet winter, um, you know, you want to do everything you can to meet the directive from the governor to cut back 8%. So that is our estimate of what it takes uh, the district in its demand management to try to improve efficiency in these higher tiers. And I use the word estimate, and I, I, I want to um, make a point here, and that is that um, although the San Juan decision says that you're, you need to cost out these tiers, we are uh, still required to make some estimates on what that takes, and I'm not shy about saying that. Um, the district does not uh, take on the administrative burden of costing this out in sufficient detail that we can just say that's exactly the difference between the cost in tier three and tier four. Thank you. We have had to, to make some adjustments to, I think, uh, uh, derive a reasonable proportion among these tiers, and proportionality is also important to achieve here. All in all, you know, the combination of the base volumetric and the, the demand management components are the quantity charge. We're not proposing that you have separate base volumetric and demand management charges, uh, simply that you sum the two together and you get the, uh, the tiered structure here, uh, the, the resulting revenue. This table right here is very important showing the math. The math uh, was not in the San Juan Capistrano's uh, report uh, for the, the court to see. We're sort of being tarred by that, that brush. It's unfortunate that it wasn't there. We want to be very uh, careful that we get this into your administrative record here. <coughs> um, so um, that's how those rates uh, were derived. Um, a few more slides. This is just a quick pictorial to give you a feel for uh, if, if you plot these tiers, uh, the, the rate is on the y-axis and 100 cubic feet is on the uh, uh, x-axis. And you'll see the current rates in blue and how they have shifted over to the red rates. We've also, we have a horizontal uh, dashed line there that shows what we've called the, uh, the average cost. It's the, if you took the uh, revenue from the quantity charges and you converted it into a uniform rate the way it is for your, your commercial customer, that's what it would be. Um, and I like to show that because it shows just how much above and below that average cost each of these tiers are. And, you know, it really makes an argument for, uh, you know, I've heard some some of the attorneys have talked about how, you know, if you have a single source, how can you justify having more than one tier? Uh, I see this just the opposite. I, th I think there's a very clear relationship between the level of service and the cost of the service. And this shows th the, th that the relationship, you know, it is much more expensive to meet these higher demands. <coughs> um, why don't we just get on here to just, uh, we're getting near the end. We have a table that just compares the base service charges that were increased 18 percent, the uh, restructuring of the uh, the residential tiers, and then the uniform uh, uh, non-residential uh, quantity charge. Uh, one last um, graph. I kind of like this one, although it's a, kind of a killer. Um, it is what it, what we're doing here is we're graphing bills, and the blue lines. The blue solid line represents the bills that customers would pay, and it's the sum of the service charge and the, um, uh, the uh, quantity charges as you go from zero out to 1,500 cubic feet. So we're going through all of the tiers. Um, <coughs> it shows the break points. Uh, blue, again, is for the current rates, and red for the proposed uh, break points. Um, 
the dash lines again show what people would pay if you had a uniform uh, rate in place, but because the uniform rate I don't think represents the, the cost of service and you do need to tier these to really reflect that. The solid line is, is you, what, what you see is it starts to depart from the blue, uh, uh, excuse me, the uh, dash line and the, and the solid line start to um, uh, break apart after you get through tier two, which is really where these uh, extraordinary costs are incurred by the district to deal with the high water use, essentially above uh, median summer demand. Um, the, the difference between the the, the blue and the, uh, red solar lines is just the it's it's the increase in the uh, um, twenty the t well for, for the quantity charges it, the, the the combined increase is you know twenty four percent you need twenty four percent more revenue you're you're getting more revenue from the quantity charges and depending on where you fall across this tier um, you you will be paying more let's go to the next slide and that shows. Uh, for a few sample customers, for the residential customers, uh, first you see the base charge uh, for uh, the current rates and then the proposed rates, the 18% increase, $7.32. And then when you add to that uh, the um, uh, quantity charge <coughs> at various levels of consumption, uh, the uh, 1,200 cubic feet represents median. Again, half the, the uh, uh, consumption is uh, uh, below and half above 1,200 cubic feet. So six is half of the median. It's getting into pretty low water use. It's just slightly out of the proposed tier one uh, break point. And then 2,400 cubic feet is getting you um, uh, beyond uh, uh, the summer median, but not uh, beyond the uh, third break point. So, <clears throat> you know, those percentage increases are, uh, I think by the time SEMA, when we were looking at, uh, was it, uh, 40 or 50 hundred cubic feet, the percentage increase was getting into the upper 40 percent. Mm -hmm. That's what it costs if you're going to use that much. For the non-residential customers, I think the most common meter size is one inch. Second most common. Second most common. Five okay, common so we chose a we chose a one inch meter, and I think the average commercial bill is 2,600 cubic feet. Mm -hmm. So again, you, you know, half of average and. Uh, two times the average, and you see the dollar and percentage differences there. This is ignoring irrigation customers, by the way. It's just looking at retail, restaurant, that type of commercial. So, to sum up, 24% <coughs> overall additional revenue is required next year. Uh, the cost of service resulted in a, a shift from non residential uh, to the residential. Uh, uh, quantity charge and the um, the base service charge, uh, which went up 18 uh, percent. The residential quantity charges increased, and depending on your level of usage, you'll see anywhere from say a 21 to potentially over 50 percent increase for very very high use. Uh, the non-residential quantity charge going up 15 percent, kind of averages out, you know, to those customers with the increased base service charge. You know, it's it's. Uh, in the uh, mid-teen range. Um, the residential quantity charge structure, we've shrunken, decreased the size of the tiers, and then we have costed out as best we can uh, each of those tiers and set the rates accordingly. So questions and discussion. Um, if you want me to just quickly brief you on this webinar um, earlier today, uh, it was sponsored by the California Urban Water Conservation Council. It had a panel of uh, three attorneys, Michael Colantuno, who was the, um, uh, the attorney for San Juan Cap Capistrano uh, until yesterday. Uh, he was replaced by uh, Kelly Salt at Best Best and Krieger, uh, and uh, one other attorney, John Backer, with another law firm, uh, were on the panel. Um, <coughs> Uh, Michael Colantuno mentioned that uh, he had filed a petition for rehearing with the uh, Court of Appeals, I think, last week, and the city had uh, since then decided to withdraw that. They are apparently in settlement negotiations. Um, but Michael was saying that he expected the State Water Resources Control Board and uh, an association of local governments down there to petition for uh, review by the Supreme Court. Um, I think the deadline for doing that is May 20th. And the Supreme Court, if, if, if it is petitioned, has uh, 30 days to respond to that. 
how long it would take. Um, I don't know, Patrick, sometimes these things can be expedited, uh, but it could take 18 months, I've, I've heard, or... Could be a while. Could, could be a while. So that's the status of the litigation. Um, uh, there was a discussion, a uh, considerable discussion about penalties, and there was a distinction made between penalty surcharges and penalties. Uh, as far as penalty surcharges are concerned, that's what I think, Patrick, you were talking about, where you said, you know, that really becomes part of your rate, and to the extent that you can cost it out, you know, cost is king in rate making these days, uh, that would be a good thing. Um, it would help if San Francisco would uh, impose excess use charges that you could pass on to customers <laughs> on a cost basis, and those could be uh, quite considerable. You know, back in the 86 through 92 drought, they had multipliers on the wholesale rates, and I think it went pretty quickly. If you were 5% over your allotment, I think it was at least two times. Uh, if you got 10% over, I think it jumped up to four times and 15, you know, th I mean, whopping, uh, 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 excess use charges that they were imposing, and those were multiples of their rates. Those are wholesale rates. They're not subject to 218. I guess they can do that, uh, at least for a while. We'll see how much longer they're not subject to 218. Um, <clears throat> so on the penalty side, though, uh, one thing that was, um, uh, Kelly Salt mentioned, uh, Health and Safety Code Section 53069.4, which I guess is the part of the Health and Safety Code that lets um, public agencies, and I don't know if there's a distinction between cities and special districts. This is where I have to be careful to keep my attorney's hat off. Um, but the, she, she did refer to that as the section that could cover penalties that could be imposed that do not have to be cost-based. Um, I think you could have penalties that could be cost-based also, and those would be to uh, curb behavior. For example, if people are violating uh, uh, restrictions on when they can irrigate uh, or, or how they use water. Um, I think in either case, you know, a penalty is a penalty. If you wanted to cost it out, you could try to, but I, I think what she was saying was you wouldn't necessarily have to cost that out. Uh, whether you could turn that into a penalty that is some sort of a multiple, you know, it's getting back into the penalty surcharge realm, and you might have to be careful about that. But it was, um, I guess it was a you know, everything that, that Patrick uh, had to tell you, I think, was just wonderful background on all of this. And the, I guess, uh, at least what we heard today was um, San Juan is not final yet. Uh, there, there's still possibility that could be uh, appealed. Um, my view on it as a rate maker is that um, it, it can be dealt with. Um, a lot of rates were not set in the way that the, the judges uh, uh, in the Court of Appeal uh, thought they should have been set. Um, the decision, uh, like a lot of decisions, uh, generates more heat than light uh, in certain areas. And in this case, I think we're all uh, a, a little warmed up by the language that refers to um, costing out the tiers based on the actual costs. Uh, rate makers don't set rates based on actual costs. If you do that, you're a, a year too late. You have to base your rates on budgeted costs. Um, so there's, there's wording like that in the decision that I'm sure uh, some further interpretation uh, will be required you know, to help us all understand. But it can certainly be, be dealt with. Um, the industry standard has been uh, everywhere, including California, to look at the rates and tiered rates and uh, structure them to uh, in encourage efficiency and discourage waste, uh, to provide a conservation signal, to provide an economic signal to customers that it's, it might be cheaper to do things that would make your irrigation and your indoor water use more efficient than to pay higher water rates. Uh, what the San Juan decision says is, yeah, you can do that, but just make sure it's based on cost, I think, and that can be done. That's what we've done here. So, thank you. Does anyone have any questions, Patrick? If you were the judge, how did yeah, he, how, how, how did he, how did he do? <laughs> Hang him. <laughs> John's pretty good, uh, <laughs> as you know. Um, uh, it, you know, it's nice when you have a rate consultant that really understands the legal issues behind Proposition 218, and John clearly does that. And I think he did. His summary was excellent. 
just just to kind of put it in the framework of, of this is a story that has not yet been fully told. Um, in 2005, you know, a year before Bighorn, you'd go to an aqua conference and you'd have 70% of the water industry attorneys saying, no way do rates, rates are not subject to 218, and a year later they are. And just last month, in a different context, groundwater extraction charges, um, you have two cases that came down within a week of each other. Um, one is a Santa Clara Valley Water District Great Oaks case just right down, down the peninsula we, where we were the attorneys um, for Santa Clara and another one is City of uh, Santa, Santa Buenaventura. Um, both cases came down and, said, and upheld the groundwater extra extraction charges. Upheld them. Good, good decision for the, for the water suppliers. But, but the rationale for those uh, decisions were exactly the opposite. One of those court cases, one of those um, courts held that groundwater extraction charges are not subject to Proposition 218. The other said groundwater extraction charges are subject to 218. Reached the same conclusion, very different ways of getting there. So that's the complexity of the world that we're living in right now, where you have courts looking at the same thing, coming down to two different conclusions. I mean, it's, that's how complex rate making has become in the water industry. And I think that I think I think that's right. You know, wholesale water rates. How, how, where's the Where's the story going to end on that? We We just don't know. Yeah. Thank you. Any, any, anyone else? Thank you for your good work, and thank you. We hope no one sues us. Now. So you'll be a, you'll be available when we need to defend our yeah, yeah. Our structure. Is that, that was built into the contract court appearances. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it 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 does happen. I hope it doesn't happen here. Um, and, and knock on something, um, the only time we've set rates that were challenged in court, they've been upheld. Um, so, you know, if we have to break a few bones to convince the other side, you know, we'll, we'll try to help you there. We, we do happen to be the rates consultant on the, for the United Water Conservation District, which was sued by San Buenaventura, and our work there to cost that out um, it was kind of disappointing when the judge said, no, you don't need to. It's not subject to 218. <laughs> so, yeah, we do spend a lot of time with attorneys and Patrick's. I think we've done our due diligence here. Yeah, so thank, yeah. Thank you. I think thank you have. You, you know, the, the moral of the story is the administrative record is very important. Yeah, you do have to connect all of the dots. Exactly. That wasn't done in Palmdale or, or San Juan, and we'll be very careful to do it here. Thank you. Yeah. Thank well, you. Okay. That won't be the end of the story on rates. <laughs> no, now we can now we can pass it on to our, our customers. Okay, we're back to item E. D? E? D. A D, I'm sorry. We were on item E. We're back to item D. Yeah. Uh, we recommend that the board schedule a public hearing for Tuesday, June 30th, and authorize the staff to issue the notice of public hearing for the proposed rate increase. Uh, attached to the staff report is the proposed notice of public hearing, which will fulfill our requirements under Prop 218. This will go out immediately. Uh, the requirement says that we have to have it out for 45 days before the public hearing. So we yeah, meet that requirement a couple of days before June yeah, 30th. Be tight, yeah. mm -hmm. okay. So moved. Second. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Oh, that should be, a roll, that call be a roll call, yeah. That's Let's a do a roll call. Okay. Julian likes the roll call. <laughs> All right, roll call, please. Victor Coverdell? Aye. Vice President Glassberg? Aye. Victor Aye. Reynolds? Victor Ford? Aye. President Michael Sell? Aye. Thank you. Thank you very much. So a lot has ha lot happened since we left that contract to you out. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did, did the price stay the same? <laughs> Wow. Although <laughs> <laughs> one way I won a hamstring last May. Should have been up to the mark, so you're right, a lot did happen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you had more time to think about it then. <laughs> oh, that, thank, thanks again. Okay, now it's our turn to take the heat when we put, drop this in the mail tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. That's three percent less than we thought. Oh. All right. Well, I'm sure we'll hear from some people. Yes. 
And with that may uh, bring some folks to our meeting uh, next time around. And we really encourage our customers to engage in our budget process. So thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank Good you. Night. Item F. All right. Uh, Kathleen's going to give us an update on the rapidly changing development. Yeah. This week's governor's order. I'll say, okay, so, so Kathleen, you have a... Uh, it's on the desktop. And it is emergency regulations. And I, I, I gave you copies of the handout, too. Whoa. Whoops. Uh, the no, not wet. Hey. Yeah, <laughs> she raised, raised the rates on that guy. He's wasting water over it. Uh-oh. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're in the top tier. <laughs> now, the LLC on the, after uh, John's name, that's she went legally the law of the corporation. Is that? <laughs> that's weird. What it really Done here. I think it's the VOCs from the finish on the desk. <laughs> that one just released. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> oh, poor Kathleen has been patiently waiting. Okay, Kathleen. Yeah. Yeah. I like the way you turn off the screen behind you when you're speaking. That's cool. I wanted to focus on me. You know? There you go. <laughs> Got that warm glow behind you. Very effective. Okay. Um, so been a lot of changes since <laughs> last month and so I'm going to update you on on some of the changes just pertaining to the um, emergency drought regulations. So um, there's been two significant uh, changes. One is that um, the SFPUC has uh, continued their request for the 10% voluntary which was very good news for, <laughs> for us. That was a relief. Um, and then the other significant um, change was the State Water Resources Control Board uh, adopted new and expanded drought regulations on May 5th to incorporate the governor's executive order. So this uh, slide that you see now up with the milestones, uh, I'm not going to go through it. It's just, you know, the, the significant actions that have been taking place um, regarding the drought since 2013. Um, so the important one is the May 5th, the very last item, May 5th, where um, the State Water Resources Control Board adopted the new regulations incorporating the governor's 25% statewide reduction mandate. Um, those are not final yet. They are expected to be final. They have to go to the, um, what, the Office of Administrative Law um, for review, and um, it's not final till they approve them. And that's expected to happen by uh, May 15th. Mm -hmm. so, um, so basically, the May 5th um, developments, um, the State Water Resources Control Board had to figure out how to implement the governor's executive order and meet that 25% statewide reduction. And the tiers were created based on summer residential uh, GPCD, gallons per capita per day, and we luckily we came out in the second tier, which is 8%. The first tier is reserved for very special cases and will be a 4%, um, and uh, you have to apply for that first tier, and but we don't qualify for that first tier. So, so we're basically in the lowest tier we could be in. Um, and again, uh, they also clarified some other language. They expanded on the reporting requirements water agencies have to do. They added to end user requirements, um, you know, prohibitions and restrictions on outdoor irrigation and things like that. So there, there's some other um, items in there. So um, basically, um, we, we still don't have all the answers in order to create an ordinance to adopt these regulations. Um, there was actually a teleconference today with the State Board where they were going over, you know, what's going to happen between now and June 1st. So, you know, they need to clarify um, some definitions and some reporting requirements and um, I have it kind of listed. They're, they're going to 
put on their website more information about rates and, and water pricing. Um, there's still more information about uh, irrigation on new development that needs to come out. They're going, they also are going to try to redo the model landscape ordinance. So there's still a lot happening um, between now and they expect it actually to go in through June. Uh, through June, some of the stuff won't be clarified completely. It's a very on a very rushed, expedited <laughs> course, but um, it does make it hard for the water agency to develop ordinances when we're still waiting for for all the answers. <coughs> so the eight percent that the district needs to meet that conservation standard is on production. It's not on sales. So that's something that um, we have to consider because that production definition includes what kind of what we call non-revenue water. So water that's lost through leaks, water that's used by um, flushing our system, water that's used by the fire department. Um, all of. Yeah. all of that is included in our production number. So, th so we have to, um, when we do the ordinance, we're going to have to take that into account when we uh, decide what the requirements are going to be in order to meet that 8% production. Um, so reduction. Prohibit, we'll prohibit fires as part of our ordinance, right? <laughs> yeah, that'll be easy. Yeah. So, um, basically, staff over the next uh, few weeks, we're still going to be in contact with the State Water Resources Control Board. We're going to um, monitor the changes and the updates that they provide us. We're going to start crafting the new ordinance. And um, we're going to bring that new ordinance to the board, hopefully, in June uh, for, your, for your approval and consideration. So that's, that's kind of a very quick update on what's been happening since um, in May, basically, with the uh, emergency drought regulations. So if you have any questions, I can uh, answer them for you. And there's more detail on the actual written staff report, so I didn't want to over all that but I had one question that's probably more appropriate for when you bring an ordinance forward but on the irrigation limitations they set you know certain days of the week for odd even no addresses do you think there are also going to be time of day limits like we have now yes so you can do it on those days between those hours or before this hour and after that hour right yes there, there definitely would be, be both those restrictions in, we, we in our ordinance. In our ordinance. Yeah. yeah. That's all. I have. And any other any other questions? Thank you. Thanks for tracking all of this. And mm -hmm. Although it's the changes are, it's going to slow down because at some point, I mean, I'm sure the governor is aware of Prop 218 and districts are trying to raise rates and the new information and changes are going to slow down and we're going to be allowed to get back to business. I would I would hope that the Pace of change um, will slow down, or information. It's going to be. A, I think it's going to be ongoing. Uh, uh, there will be constant updates, um, interpretations of the regulations, especially um, enforcement. Once enforcement starts, um, there's a lot of questions that agencies obviously have about how the state board plans to enforce. Um, uh, you know, the eight percent or whatever tier an agency's in, in addition to the end user requirements. So, uh, you know, and, and everyone's heard about the fines, the $10,000 fines, the $500 fines. So the, there's still a lot of questions, and, and to be honest, the State Board doesn't have all the answers right now. There's a huge gap right now between the governor's 25% goal and what the state is actually achieving. And Felicia Marcus, in a, in a session at the Aqua Conference last week, basically said, you know, we're going to be looking at this in June and July. And, and there'll be more action by the State Water Resources Control Board. In the next few months, uh, the warm months are really the only opportunity the state has to make progress against this uh, reduction goal. I think the, the latest statewide reduction number is 3 or 4 percent. Mm -hmm. yeah, so that, that gulf between the mm -hmm. governor's goal and, and the actual achievement mm -hmm will create a lot of political pressure, a lot of pressure on the State Water like Resources Control culture. Board to do more. So there will be, uh, I think we can anticipate there'll be more. Wow. 
Ho hopefully we don't have our own gulf. <laughs> yes, I hope so. Thank you. Joe, what happened to the $100,000? Or not $100,000? Oh, oh, almost $100,000 at this rate. <laughs> are, are they at the upper tier of our rate structure? Uh, no. Uh, uh, are we in the back charge? The fire department is exempt from paying for water. I think we better think about that. Yeah, so, yeah, that was one of the highlights, as you just brought up. Uh, and, and I'd just like to point out that uh, the uh, it was reported incorrectly. Uh, yeah. Uh, it was actually operator error on the part of the person operating that fire hydrant. He uh, basically uh, <laughs> unscrewed, <it. laughs> unscrewed the uh, operating valve completely. Uh, so that's why in the photo that you may have seen uh, on the web or in the paper, the water was shooting out both directions. Uh, so I just wanted to get that cleared up. It so was should, not a fault of the hydrant. Should we provide so. them with a dummy dry hydrant? For well, the actually, that, that's <laughs> a really, I'm glad you brought that up. Wet hydrant? <laughs> Uh, treatment supervisor Sean Donovan uh, stepped right up, uh, <laughs> and he he went over to the fire department the very next day, gave him a very brief primer on on <laughs> on how to do this, and he offered to set up a more formal training on the uh, extensive uh, on the use of, of fire hydrants, complete with a uh, a complete hydrant with a cutaway, yeah. so that. Uh, you could, they could observe the internal uh, operations of the of the hydrant itself uh, as part of the, the training. So uh, that's in the that's in the works, and that that uh, ho the hopefully that will happen. Uh, I think it's a good thing. And, and again, that's that's part of the uh, interagency uh, cooperation that we really strive for uh, because it could only do good. Yes. Is, is there uh, any way? Um, excuse me. A lot of the um, local construction companies have meters and they take water from hydrants for water trucks. Correct. Um, I just wondered if there's any way to coordinate the schedule with the fire people when they need to have training to go to a place where they're actually going to use the water that they're going to run through the meter as opposed to just blowing it out in the street or whatever they do with it. Yeah, uh, it's possible, it's difficult. Well, of course, it's but it's possible. water and it's a drought. Uh, you know, we can provide the fire district with the uh, with the contractors who presently are in possession of meters, uh, and they would have to coordinate it themselves. Now, whether they will or not, that's that's totally up to them. But we can provide them the vehicle by which that can be done. Um, well, it's just sad when you think about you know, or or it'd be nice if it was be coordinated with a, a blowing out of a line that we have to do to you know to purge our lines or you know so, something like that would be nice to coordinate and then of course you could have a competent person on hand to make sure the person learning you That's, know actually understood how it worked under pressure the, the part of the uh, NPDES uh, revisions that have taken place uh, that now uh, uh, have targeted the water utilities uh, for any discharge from water utilities. It, it only re uh, it only really uh, uh, referenced um, wastewater in the past, but now they're really focusing on on uh, potable water. Also, part of that provision is that if you are having an automatic blow off, for instance, uh, which we have one at the end of '92, uh, if we could. They would rather us make the best use of that water, and it's written into 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 these rules to do what the most we can to to do exactly what you're you're stating, or if we're flushing, you know, fill a water truck, or you know, irrigate something if you can. It's not it's it's really difficult. It's not always practical whatsoever. Right. Uh, it would probably cost us more, but it is within the realm of. A possibility, and we will be exploring this uh, this year and, and uh, in the future. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, and I'm not trying to make a big deal out of it. But you know, I know there are median landscaping conditions that exactly. you know, if it was put into a water truck and 
spread into a median. That's well, got to be a better something use. we coordinate with the city. You want to, uh, you know, you want to irrigate these medians. Well, yeah, we have to flush over here, or we get, you know, uh, we 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 put out about fourteen thousand gallons uh, a month on various uh, maintenance activities. Uh, we could we could coordinate with that. Yeah, that's thanks. Cool. I know you got a lot in your choice. Yeah. Uh, and the only other highlight that I want to mention is that Daniston Rand retired 30 days in April. Uh, and with with rain in the forecast, would there be enough for us and the farmer? Or yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, we actually have the Department uh, or the the California Water Res Water Resources Control Board coming out for their annual inspection after about five years. Uh, so they're coming out next uh, Wednesday. And Sean, treatment supervisor, is he's, he's wondering if we could last that long. Hopefully this rain on Thursday yeah, will time. allow, will buy us some time. And he is talking with, with, uh, with, with Dave yeah. Leah, the farmer, so that, because we, the, the state does want us to be running when they come and do the inspection. And this will be the first full-blown inspection uh, uh, while, after the treatment, after the upgrades to the treatment plant. So uh, it's pretty important for us. It's pretty important for them. Uh, we're, poised, we're poised to make a good impression. Good, good. Yeah. Lot, that's good to hear. Let's, yeah, let's okay. hope we get a significant rain. Good. Anyone else or any other highlights or questions? Uh, Hearing none, thank you very much. Thank you. Great job, thanks. Looks like Eric Clapton with those glasses. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you remember my favorite song, Let It Rain? <laughs> Let your love well, you guys rain. Let that your one. love rain down on me. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, <laughs> that would conclude this meeting and then we have a regular meeting next month and a special meeting on the thirtieth, correct? Okay. I got to tell you, um, I don't know how you guys feel about it, but I think the reporting uh, of the financial conditions, et cetera, in the district have been uh, incredibly enhanced by the addition of, of Mary. And uh, I think a lot of the stuff that we heard from the tier people well, talking he, today yeah, came it was, from it was Mary. It very, very apparent that they worked, worked well together, and it was that presentation was very helpful in the numbers that the staff provided. Yeah, and it made for a very defensible document, should, should it be challenged, and so thanks to all. Well, and I know that Gina's working hard on it, Joe's working, I mean, the whole staff, but, but it's really nice to have Mary's uh, careful eye right now. Yeah, Appreciate it's great. It. Thank you. Thank Meeting you. adjourned. Adjourned.